Greetings from the dark continent, Conscious Caracol here, or Adams Van Sale. And tonight I'm joined by Russell Lamberti, the founder of investment advisory firm ETM Macro Advisors and the co-author of When Money Destroys Nations, a book about Zimbabwe's hyperinflation crisis. And you might recognize him from a previous episode when uh, he featured on my channel when we talked about the economics of the lockdown. But tonight we're not going to be talking about contemporary matters. We're going to look farther into the past, but we're going to bring it back to the present in regards to how ancient knowledge can still be very relevant and practical in the modern age. Welcome on, on the show, Russell. Hey, Ernst, it's really good to be with you again. And uh, I'm looking forward to this discussion, you know, because we don't, we don't have, I, you know, I don't have a lot of interviews like this. And, um, and, and talking about biblical principles is certainly one of my passions. And relating, relating it to, to, to economics and to the political order is particularly interesting for me. And, uh, you know, in, 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 in these great, great ancient scriptures, we find uh, an immense reservoir of wisdom. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. And, uh, you know, when, I, when, I, when I'm caught short and I can't answer one of your questions properly or I don't have the depth of biblical knowledge, I'll, I'll be very honest about that. But I think, yeah, what I'm looking forward to is just kind of having a two-way flow of conversation and uh, exploring some of these ideas. I've spent some time looking into some of this stuff. The Bible is a very, very big very complicated um, and, and sometimes very strange book and, and quite inaccessible for certain people if you don't know where to go and where to start. Um, so maybe I can help with a little bit of that as well. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to, to digging into really scratching the surface on this stuff. We've probably got an hour tonight and uh, mm -hmm. that'll just get us into the intro, intro level stuff. But, uh, but hopefully that's yeah. good enough. Yeah. Well, I think something uh, to lay the foundation pretty much for this conversation is one of the things that people would say when they see the, the type of title that I gave to the streamer, the economics and political principles in the Bible, is that a lot of people would have a knee-jerk reaction and say that, why are you looking to a, a book that's over 2,500 uh, 2, years old? for lessons that uh, can be applied in the present. And I mean, the argument would be that we have had so, so many different thinkers and analysts and philosophers in the meantime that have made a lot more sense and refined almost these old lessons. Why would you go back to these types of ancient scriptures if we have this vast reservoir of more modern uh, philosophers and thinkers and minds that have actually done a lot of uh, progress in regards to uh, expanding this da database, if you will, of information at our fingertips? That's a really good question. I mean, I, and, and, you know, I think I think straight away when people hear this topic, you're going to get a, an immediate divide between between Christian uh, believers, um, between Christ followers and and people who are more skeptical, atheists, uh, uh, you know, agnostic uh, communities. Who, who, who tend to view the Bible as, you know, perhaps an interesting ancient text. Um, but there's lots of interesting ancient texts and why, what makes the Bible so special. I mean, I, I don't think we can go into all of that tonight. Um, there are excellent uh, scholars and thinkers and, and, and biblical philosophers and Christian philosophers who can, who can get into, you know, quite how incredible uh, – the, the, the Bible is and, and how amazing these, these ancient scriptures are. But I think I would, I would sort of answer that as simply as possible by saying that, you know, the, the idea that we never lose knowledge in history um, is, I think, a false idea. Um, I think that there are times when societies forget um, lessons. They, they have a memory gap of certain very foundational uh, moral and uh, and sort of practical principles um, of you know civic uh, government um, of of how to structure society of economic principles and you know it's a, it's amazing that that you'll go and find principles in the Bible that are sound principles um, they've lasted so long and and one of the reasons why they've lasted so long and one of the reasons why that book uh, why this book, the Bible, um, has, is, is still the most widely printed and most widely read book in history 
is because these principles transcend time and place. And it's, it's the, um, it's the society with a very short memory, the society that, um, that disregards these truths that can get into real trouble. And it's amazing to witness the state of the world today. And you could go through reams and reams of examples of where governments and societies are disregarding biblical principles to their great peril and to their great detriment and to the detriment of, of economies, the detriment of monetary and financial systems. Um, we've kind of really lost our way. And, uh, um, it's, it, you know, going back into the philosophers of the last few hundred years, you will find certainly some great answers, but we mustn't forget that many of those philosophers were building upon other philosophers who themselves were building upon biblical foundations. Um, and then I think that the final way to just answer that is just to say that philosophy that's not centered in a biblical worldview, in a Christ-centered worldview, in a, in a theistic worldview, in my opinion um comes up short uh reveals itself over and over again to be to be actually quite shallow um because at, at core the philosophy that 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 you're drawing from needs to have um an accurate perspective on on who we are and what the nature of this world is and what the sort of correct anthropology of of you know, of life is and, and how we got here and why we exist. And I think these, uh, these are answers that, that we can reach deep into, into the past and into, into biblical traditions to, to find. And so I just, you know, anyone who reads the Bible seriously and anyone who goes through um, some of these great scriptures just knows that they're drawing on a very, very deep well of, of wisdom that society periodically forgets. And then you have revival and then people latch onto these truths again and, uh, and, and society starts to reform in a constructive way. And then, and then you have a time of forgetting again. And so it's, it's not just a case where, we, where we're always learning and we're always improving. There are significant bumps in the road where we need to draw once again on ancient wisdom. Mm, absolutely. And I think that's one of the, the great fallacies of our time is the, <laughs> the, the assumption that uh, people in the past, uh, did, because they didn't have this huge database, uh, da database of information that they could uh, tap information from, uh, that means they were less informed. I mean, you can, you can see, for example, this type of thinking when people look at uh, science and they say, well, uh, science has always been, uh, in their words, at war with religion. And then you look into the past and you realize, but actually a lot of the great scientists uh, were building their knowledge on Christian foundations. They had the, they were building it on the idea that, that if you understand the world and the creation, you will have a better understanding of the creator. And uh, right. this, this goes for the Bible as well, where if you argue that uh, this knowledge that we see in the Bible has already been refined, therefore that makes the Bible redundant. Um, then you are going on the premise that these people that lived during that time didn't have the same hardware as you. And I think that's the biggest mistake you can make. And I'm talking about your biological hardware. I yeah. think uh, they were just like us. They were dealing with a lot of similar problems. Uh, I, I don't think in the past 2000 years, the nature of evil has changed. I don't think the nature of oppression has changed. It's still fundamentally the same thing. And these people were dealing with it. And these people were faced with many of the same problems and they were writing about it and they were use it, tapping into almost the knowledge that has become timeless and i mean you mentioned it there's a reason why that why a book uh, lasts for more than two thousand years and is still one of the most widely read books on the planet there must be a reason there it can't just be uh, be because of mere chance or because of some glitch in the matrix yeah i think those are great points um you know books that stand the test of time are worth reading and you know the same is true of of philosophy you know uh, reading a book that's 200 years old that that still has has relevance for for today um these are often you know some of the best books that you can read um the odds that you're going to be reading a great book that's only two or three years old are quite low right now maybe that book survives another 200 years um, maybe that book that was written in 2018, you know, survives, you know, two, 300 years and, and, and proves itself over time. But really, you know, you're taking pretty big chances when you're reading new stuff. And often the new stuff is quite shallow and quite and quite sort of uh, quite skin deep. And some of it's very useful, but but it's when you dig into this timeless stuff that you really get 
wisdom that sort of transcends rationality or rational understanding sometimes um, or rationalistic uh, perspectives on the world and goes into and taps into you know i think i think deeper deeper truths and deeper perspectives and finally i will say that i i totally agree i, I don't think that there's any conflict between you know faith um, and science at all i mean uh, uh, in the biggest picture of this whole thing um science faith understanding the nature of reality is is precisely uh is precisely what the point it's it's to discover what's true um you know if we are created by god and that is true um then then that's part of our discovery process of, of what we think is true and science should augment that that process of discovery um and uh and you know you get you get people who would who would say that miracles uh, sort of contradict science or science contradicts miracles but uh if we're created by god if we're created by a transcendent perfect uh, being who's all powerful and all knowing um for that god to perform supernatural to intervene um on earth in in supernatural ways is not a problem at all and so what what you often get with materialists and atheists is they just limit themselves epistemologically um and they sort of by definition rule out any any chance of there being you know miracles or or or, or there being a god um but i don't think that uh, in any way that the pursuit of of trying to understand this world which is really what science is it's trying to gain knowledge about this, the nature of reality in all sorts of ways and in all sorts of spheres and using all sorts of different methodologies um and so and so trying to understand the nature of creation the, the nature of being the nature of existence is just another facet of that quest for understanding and that quest for knowledge so i don't, I don't see the conflict and i think people who try and play up that conflict between science and faith um you know usually either don't understand the different realms of epistemology that you're dealing with when you're dealing with sort of so-called scientific method and and, and issues of, of theology um, and philosophical arguments for god and so on um, or they're just deliberately trying to um to undermine and to discredit um the pursuit of truth um in the realms of of faith and and theology um, and i don't think we need to do that i think i think everything is about trying to understand who we are why we're here the nature of reality and that has to include physical as well as metaphysical considerations mm. no that those are very good points russell and i think uh something to to segue into uh seeing as your economics really is your field um there was a tweet that you made a while back that uh, i found very interesting and i really wanted you to elaborate on it but for context uh, so it was Leviticus 19 verse 15. So I'll just read it here and then uh, I'd like you to give us a bit more of more insight into regards to what you read in there. So the, the verse goes, do not do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. And your comment on that was that this is a rejection of both social welfare, uh, welfareism and corporate cronyism in one short Bible verse. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I think, I think this is again, an example where, um, where we see instruction and, and, uh, admonitions in the Bible that can really be used in, in a modern context and really interpreted in a modern context uh the verse uh say, as you've just read says don't show partiality to the poor um nor to nor to the mighty um in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor um you know we live in a we live in a modern political society where it is considered um sort of almost the highest political moral good to 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 let the world know how much you're on the side of the poor so if you listen to politicians debating if you listen to the u.s presidential debates if you listen to to public debates in south africa um it's sort of always incumbent upon upon the people in that debate to try and signal their virtue 
as to how much they intend or how much they care about the poor. Um, but the poor are just human beings like everyone else. There's no special moral category um, that the Bible affords to the poor. Some Christians think there is, and, and more sort of socialist-leaning Christians believe that the entire Bible is sort of orientated towards giving special favor to the poor. Um, but I think a clear reading of Scripture uh, rejects that notion. Um, it certainly is very uh, uh, clear about helping the poor, particularly the poor within your own community, particularly the poor in your midst. Um, the, 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 the Old Testament scriptures are, are you know, there's, there's many, many scriptural references to helping the poor. Yes, also helping foreigners, um, but certainly the poor within your community is, is a huge uh, factor, but that is, that is always orientated um, around alleviating their, their needs and, their, and, and, and meeting their needs in ways that don't uh, make them, in ways that are not unhealthy, in ways that, that don't make them dependent, uh, permanently dependent kind of uh, underclass. Um, and I think what's also important is the Bible is very clear about, about the nature of poverty and why poverty exists in a particular context. And I think this is critical, and this is the distinction that the Bible makes over and over again that, that basically you can see in, in modern political discourse we've just lost, which is, um, or at least in the mainstream, which is, which is that there's different kinds of reasons for, for why people are poor. Sometimes it's because of injustice, and sometimes it's just because of a lack of wisdom, uh, sinfulness, um, bad choices, um, failing to, to um, heed advice, failing, fa failing to actually uh, spend time obtaining wisdom to operate in the world. Um, that's not to say that that's you know, there's both kinds of poverty. The poverty that results from injustice is, is also a very real thing. But the Bible is very clear that, that in, in, in those instances, what must be remedied is the injustice, not the injustice stays and then you, you create some kind of offsetting uh, policy during this injustice where you sort of prop up the poor um, to sort of help them against this injustice. The the Bible is often very clear that you go to the root of the injustice. Um, so I think that's really, really interesting. That's really important about how the Bible frames this whole discussion around around the poor. Um, so it is, you know, you will get uh, people who try to justify um, socialistic ideology using using the scriptures, and they will cite, you know, many of these scriptures uh, referencing the poor. Um, but I think if you if you just have a clear reading of of the context of of of, uh, of how the poor are to be treated, it is to it is to alleviate injustices, to not be partial to the poor in in judgment. So if a poor guy steals something, you must he must be punished for 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 that uh, for that act, um, and and there's no partiality and judgment between between poor and rich. And, and the same goes for the other side. As I said in that tweet. It also prohibits corporate cronyism, favoring the wealthy, favoring the old boys club and the network and bailing out, bailing out companies that have made bad decisions. Um, uh, throughout scripture, you, you see this, this admonition as much as you see calls to help the poor, but also not to be partial towards the poor or biased towards the poor. Um, you also see this admonition to not be partial towards the rich. And you can see that that's in many ways probably in ancient times before before democratic societies really flourished where it's now sort of politically expedient to 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 be pro poor you could see back in those in those ancient uh, kingdoms it was probably much more politically expedient to be pro rich to be to be favoring to be offering favorable contracts and favorable judgments to to the wealthy and that's always been how societies have been kind of captured by an elite class. And once they get captured by that class, they, they serve that they, they structure the society for the ends of a very narrow elite. And uh, that system ultimately collapses in some kind of 
revolt um, and the foundations of that hierarchy are then are then smashed so you can see you know excessive partiality towards the poor is going to lead us into a kind of uh, socialistic uh, situation uh, where we you know we tax the rich we 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 rob money from from entrepreneurs and landowners to try and to try and be partial towards the poor but equally on the other side if we're partial to the rich you devolve into a kind of crony elite sort of type system in many ways the, the present world is is sort of characterized by both you have this kind of partiality towards an elite you have, and you have this pro poor kind of socialistic policy uh rising up and getting crushed in the middle are, are, are the, the middle classes and the and, and the sort of uh interdependent and codependent classes um that that really ultimately produce a lot of the real the real wealth and goods and services so i just find a verse like this and there's many in the bible that, that can really start to give lots of clarity and very simple language about some of these uh some of these political dynamics mm. I'm really glad you mentioned the, the current state of affairs because I just wanted to mention that uh, if you look at the world today, we are living in a time where we have corporations that have more power than nations. We have corporations that, I mean, a good example would be uh, the big tech uh, oligarchy in the US where big tech has become so powerful that they can silence uh, the quote unquote king. And then you have to ask yourself if there's a power that's strong enough to silence the king, uh, then who really is in charge? And that we saw with the suspension of uh, then the then sitting president, Donald Trump, uh, having his Twitter yeah. account removed and on other social media as well. And we, we've gotten to this point where this type of cronyism is having at incredible effects on the world and on politics and on discourse i mean social media is pretty much the modern public square it is the equivalent of going back in time to biblical times and having a monopoly on the literal public square and what can be said there even in whispers so i think that is one of the big uh, conundrums of our time is the fact that this type of mega corporations multi-billion dollar national <clears throat> international corporations having all this power having all this say and they're not alone they have the support of governments they have the support of uh, ideologues and they have the support of a lot of normal people as well that see nothing wrong with it and don't see the danger ahead yeah i think this is an interesting one because um i i hear you and i look i've been I've, i'm sort of i've been less keen to jump on the on the bandwagon of 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 considering this our biggest problem at the moment um or, or a huge problem what i think Ernst, is that when you see twitter banning the president um i think that's that's the end point of a very long road of cronyism that went before it and uh and it culminates in an action that when you think about it just from a purely legal perspective uh you know and, and some people might argue this but twitter were within their rights to, to to do that to the president um and you might say but it shouldn't be like that this is now the public square but what i'm saying to you is that <clears throat> is that that event was the culmination of 25 or 30 or probably 40 years of of a kind of cronyism that we see um not just in tech in in the tech space but but you know you see it in banking um you see it in in all kinds of sectors um but if you if you think about those tech companies all the way along their journey they they get favors from the state uh there's there's some compelling arguments that companies like google um are really almost like parastatal organizations and that they're we south africans understand very well yeah and, and 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 you know i don't just mean that in, in in the sense that they're big companies and therefore they're kind of like utilities i actually mean it in the sense that their birth and their and their founding and their actual launching um uh, almost certainly had very large government fingerprints um you know all over it um certainly the way a lot of these companies were granted patent protection for very long um, the way that they've been able to grow their reach and influence, I think, uh, to suggest that there was no uh, government um, uh, uh, partiality 
through through the development of most of those big uh, tech companies. And Michael Rechtenwald, um, he's a professor in the United States, did a really good talk on this at one of the Mises Institute. Uh, recent, uh, I think it was in the in the fourth quarter of last year, a Mises Institute event, and he he speaks about um, these kind of. He, he doesn't use the word parastatal. Um, he's got an interesting word for it, but these tech companies have have, have grown up very much uh, with that kind of influence. What's the biblical principle here, Aaron? The biblical principle is that what we've got in the formation of a lot of these companies, um, in the way that the that the corporate that the commercial sphere is regulated by by the governments is i think what you've probably got is um a misapplication of the proper realm of authority of civil government um civil government biblically uh is is as far as i as far as i understand it um not really in the realm of regulating commerce um not really in the realm of of bailing out companies and favoring favoring uh cronies what it is in the realm of doing is ensuring justice is ensuring um that 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 rights are respected is ensuring that uh if if someone's property is violated by a company um, that there's recourse, um, and so and so the civil government is the realm of courts. It's the realm of justice. It's the realm of settling disputes. Um, it's the realm of administering um, laws. Uh, but those are the laws that pertain, really, uh, you know, predominantly to um, to how humans um, interact uh, peacefully, how societies are peacefully structured. The realm of commerce uh, in sort of biblical gov government terms is, is far more in the realm of family government. Um, business is much more centered around, biblically around the family. And value creation is, 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 a, is a family and multi-generational uh, endeavor. Um, and, then, and then your other big sphere of government would be, would be you know, the ecclesia or the church. Um, where, where, which, is, which is predominantly your realm of kind of moral governance um uh for that for the society so so you wouldn't and the idea would really be that these that these realms the family church uh civil government that they don't encroach um on one another's territory that they're actually kind of these relatively autonomous centers of power that are that are uh cooperative and that complement one another uh, but when you get the government reaching into family matters reaching into moral matters it's sort of uh, overstepping its its jurisdiction from a from a governance perspective. Um, so I think you know if you go back to the biblical model of government, uh, it is all about a a a, um, a small tolerable um, civil authority that uh, impartially and justly administers um, the laws of the land, uh, but is not. An, inst an institution that is now meant to get its hands into into the money into the monetary system get its hands into uh regulating corporations get its hands into favoring various corporations and my contention would be that if we had um for example in the u.s a totally impartial um disengaged civil government from the affairs of commerce um besides besides administering justice in that realm um so if a company kills people negligently if a company encroaches on property rights yes government civil government steps in to settle those disputes but subsidizing companies bailing them out giving them patents um giving them favored licenses over other companies and so on None of this is the realm of civil government. And I think that it would be very difficult to have such a big technology oligarchy like you have in the US if you hadn't, if it hadn't been preceded by decades and decades of corporate cronyism. Um, so, so again, I think, I think you're talking about a problem that is probably the culmination of many decades of a civil government that has completely jumped the fence in terms of its, uh, 
in terms of its its proper jurisdiction. Mm. No, absolutely, and I think a central point there is this uh, just fusion of government and uh, the corporate world and the, all these big corporations. And that's where you get to this point where you realize that it's a symbiotic relationship, that the, the one is reinforcing the other, the one is granting uh, favors to the other. And then once you start untangling this uh, this mess, you start realizing how deep this actually goes. I mean, this is what Donald Trump talks about when he talks about the swamp. He talks about just this absolute monster yeah. of a leviathan that's been created from the the unholy marriage of the corporation the corporate and the the political where you get a point where the 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 old uh, the old uh, talking point would be but censorship is just when the government censors someone but then uh, today you'd see uh, the the oppressors kind of found a loophole. They found out that they don't have to censor people. They just have to use their their corporate uh, their co corporate buddies or their corporate watchdogs to do it for them. And then uh, people will will argue for that. That's perfectly fine, and there's nothing wrong with that. But as you touched on uh, earlier, there is that the root of the problem is that umbilical cord between these corporations and the state that's causing all of this. Um, and yeah, I completely yeah. agree that uh, this is definitely a culmination. It's something that's been in the works for decades. It's not just something that uh, popped out of the ground yesterday. But uh, I think it's one of the, the key things that needs to be discussed today in order for us to, to understand not only uh, where we've come from, but also where we're going in regards to. Uh, and we're not only seeing it in the US, we're seeing this across the world. We're seeing uh, nation states everywhere, all across the world, following the same model and moving towards that type of uh, integration between the, the big corporations and the state. Yeah, it's a very, very cozy alliance. Um, in many ways, it's maybe a bit simplistic, but one of the ways you could describe the, the sort of modern political battleground is is that it's between a group who are, are willing to be or who want to be partial to to the wealthy uh, and and to the corporate interests and and the group who want to be partial to the poor as i've said and and, and it's actually both of those are are the wrong path both of those are incorrect and both of those are going to ensnare um the the hard working guy in the middle right the guy who's not poor um, but he's also not a corporate crony he's not one of the corporate elites and this guy in the middle gets gets taxed to death um, to fund corporate bailouts and to fund welfare checks for other people um, he gets taxed to death by by inflation which which uh, sort of bails out you know corporations as well and bails out the government and I think this this probably reasonably accurately describes where we are right now. And um, it's quite interesting, you know, in many ways, your sort of revolt, your sort of revolution that's bubbling to the surface now is, is not like your sort of caricatured revolution where it's like the, the lowest of the low, the people on the absolute bottom rung, uh, you know, carrying pitchforks to, to the government buildings. It's kind of a middle class revolution, you know. Um, when you think about the Brexit story, when you think about the Trump story, when you think about the yellow vests in, in France, and when you think about a lot of the protests that are going on, um, it's people it's of a lot of, kind of not, uh, as you said, the, the lower rung that, uh, as Marx would say, uh, that have nothing to lose and therefore they are doing it. It's rather the people that are slowly seeing everything they've yeah. built up over the decades just starting to chip away and seep away. Uh, yeah, and that's, then the that's, same that's even true um, to a degree um, of, of Antifa and, and BLM. You know, they're, they're expressing that anguish and that angst in a, in a different way. And they, their, their sort of, their sort of proposed solutions for how to fix it are very different to to other people and and very misguided. But if you go and dig into to a lot of the, that that movement, that that Antifa kind of kind of uh, broader movement, I mean, it's basically middle class, college educated uh, people that they they probably struggling. They're probably not earning that well. They probably got too much student debt and uh and can't find good jobs and all that 
but these are not these are not like the, the peasant class and and actually this is kind of consistent with with most of history um you know uh, the french revolution was not a peasant revolution uh the french revolution was was kind of a middle class revolution again you know a, a terrible kind of ideology ideological possession drove that revolution um but it uh, it often comes from these sorts of quarters of course what we've seen from on the sort of right wing uh is 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 perhaps more um anal analogous to to the vendee uh in in the french revolution who were kind of a, a working class conservative movement who the who the who the jacobins actually you know waged you know terrible war on and who the french revolutionaries uh, hated because they were industrious they were they were christian um and they they, they didn't really like the monarchy uh, but they also didn't support the the hardcore kind of uh, guillotine socialism of the of the revolutionaries mm -hmm. the, these are these are fascinating kind of parallels to what we're seeing today but it's it's really interesting that the protagonists in 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 all these instances are really drawn from 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 this middle section of society that is getting uh heavily squeezed by inflation and taxation and regulation uh small businesses can't operate properly um it's not to say that the poor are well off the poor are struggling but um they're getting welfare checks they're getting support grants uh where's it all coming from it's coming from this this kind of middle that's being really squeezed and so it's a fascinating thing and and you know this verse in leviticus leviticus 19 15 in just a few words just kind of really launches us into this whole discussion on on where the appropriate uh, sort of boundaries of civil government are and why you don't um you don't want to show partiality to rich or poor yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Uh, this entire discussion that we've just had is based on just one verse. I think that's a, a very good thing to point out. Um, and yeah, I think uh, my last thoughts uh, on that would be that uh, what you're seeing here is also something very frustrating. And that's the fact that none of these political commentators or commentary at whatever you want to call them that are earning six figure salaries seem to be able to diagnose the problem. They all, for example, if you ask them, analyze how Trump gained power, they will just uh, sum it up as this was just a bunch of uh, rednecks, uh, people that are basically, as they would say, the garbage of uh, society, uneducated, that people that didn't, that don't have jobs, people that uh, are, are uninformed, and they would stereotype them in that way, but it would be uh, expert opinion uh, coming from them. They would genuinely analyze it that way, and it can't be farther yeah. from the truth. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if your if your political analysis, uh, and, and you know, it's it's easy to fall into this trap. Um, but if your political analysis starts with that whole group over there are really really dumb, if that's or your, or, yeah, evil or or both, basically evil and dumb, um, you 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 you're you're on the wrong you're on the wrong track. A lot of South Africans do this with ANC voters. Um, they look at all those voters and they go, the only explanation could be that you're you're kind of either evil or you're dumb or you're both. Um, I mean, it'll be a whole tangent to go into what I think I think the, the correct way to analyze ANC voters is. Um, but it's a big mistake to just start off with they're all completely clueless. Uh, in the case of South Africa, you've got a lot of people voting for something far deeper than economic policies voting for something far deeper than than uh than sort of whether your electricity stays on or not i mean they're, they're voting for kind of deep-rooted cultural and nationalistic reasons um and and the reasons why people are voting for trump uh are also uh very very deep and they go to the more core of, they go to the core of identity they go to the core of what it means to belong um and I've been thinking about this quite a lot, but but politics is really so much about about um, negotiating your your way into a place of true belonging in a community and in a society. 
And as long as people feel like they don't belong, like their community is fragmented or their culture is watered down by, by a kind of multicultural uh, sort of milieu, um, they're going to, politics is going to be very unsettled. Uh, settled politics results from, from politics that has achieved for all people the ability to truly belong to truly belong in a community. Um, and once you get there, then you can sort of fight about whether your tax rate should be 20% or 22%, or you can, you know, you can, you can have these kind of seemingly uh, frivolous and, and sort of, you know, less important discussions. But until, until you get there, you have to have the big discussions around, around, uh, around belonging, around culture, around compatibility and around making peace with different groups of people that ordinarily struggle to, to, to get along, to be cohesive with one another. Um, and yeah, the, the, you know, it's just amazes me how broken the discussion is in so many parts of, of the political debate that we're going to, and, and I mean, this goes both ways, right? I think I think it goes Absolutely. from from the left to towards the right when they call the right a bunch of kind of neo-Nazi rednecks and who don't know what they're, you know, who are clueless. I think it probably goes the other way as well. You know, I think I think there's probably a large group of people who would consider themselves on the left, um, who are who are basically kind of yearning for for probably the same thing as a lot of people on the right. Um, maybe not the radical left, but certainly a lot of people on, on the center and moderate left. I think that there's a, there's a deep yearning for, for a sense of belonging. I think politics is all about creating a, 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 a space where you can belong. And as long as you don't have that space, the politics is going to be angry, fractious, and unsettled. And that's, you know, South Africa has been living that for, for decades. Um, America's only really just catching up to us now. Uh, I just, well, I've been neglecting the chat uh, for a while, so I'm just going to read some messages here that caught my eye that I found interesting. Uh, so Russell McLaren, uh, your name, uh, namesake, said, uh, the Bible is anti-egalitarian, which is also natural law. Uh, Sideline opinion said, materialism is doing its best to convince mankind that the unseen is not real. And then another one that uh, stood out to me was this one. But before I get to him, I just want to uh, say hello here to I. Let me just check here. Where was that? Yeah, my old flatmate from from Stellenbosch, Neil Pretorius. I see is tuning in from South Korea. Hey, Neil. <laughs> I hope it's going well. Thank you so much for making time to uh, come check out my stream. He was there when this uh, when this channel started off in its uh, in its infancy. So uh, great to see him still here after all these years. And then finally, just one uh, last message here from Groen Ontkat, who says Christianity has the ability to take the common man, the powerless person, and lift them out of the dangers of falling into the clutches of resentment and give them a way to access higher orders of truths or ordered truths. I, uh, I completely agree with that. That's a, that's a great comment. I mean, we don't have to get into this because mm -hmm. it's a whole other rabbit hole. But, um, you know, I think, I think true Christianity, true Christian theology, true biblical wisdom is radically anti-victimhood. Um, radically. <laughs> it's radically anti-grievance and, and the, the, the politics of grievance and the politics of victimhood and the state of being a victim. Uh, the Bible is, is just dripping with with the opposite of that it's dripping with with um you know the 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 firstly i, I would say the the revelation of grace the, the revelation um of of the goodness of god and the fact that uh that no matter what your circumstance um you can you that, that circumstance can be redeemed um and and then full of pages of wisdom about uh, applying yourself through hard work, through wisdom, um, and then actually getting to a place where you're not only not a victim anymore, 
but you're actually ministering to others. You're, you're, you're giving to others. You're overflowing to others. That is, that is really the, the sort of biblical picture. Um, so if, you, if you're looking for an antidote to victimhood, you know, victim culture, uh, grievance politics, uh, what do they call it? The sort of hierarchy of, of victimhood and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, you, 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 the Bible is, is, is your place. As far as, uh, I just want to pick up on the one comment by Russell there, the, the egalitarian thing. I mean, it's interesting because, because I think that's, I think that's probably broadly true, but of course you, you get, you get this calling to, uh, which, which is not, an, not a calling to egalitarianism and to equity, but it's a calling to, to, to fairness and to righteousness and to dealing righteously with people, with rich or poor. Um, so it's, uh, I think what the Bible does do throughout is call, call us towards, towards a relative degree of, of um, fairness. It's not always necessarily impartial, because there's admonitions to to treat your your fellow community members differently than you would necessarily treat treat foreigners, and I think that's that's kind of a natural a natural thing. Um, but yes, I, I think that at core um, the Bible does reject um, egalitarianism, and you know there's this there's this there's that great parable where uh, master hires someone at the start of the day. And then as the day goes on, he, he hires more people. But of course, as he hires them later in the day, I forget the exact part of Scripture. It's a New Testament Scripture. It's one of the parables of, of, of Christ. Um, but as he hires them later on in the day, of course, they're going to work fewer hours. And then right in the last hour of the day, um, he, uh, he, hires, he hires someone uh, just for an hour. Um, and of course, at the end, he pays them all the same amount. Now, someone might look at that and go, but hang on, that sounds like socialism to me. Uh, but that's, that's uh, what, what's fascinating about that is precisely the kind of inequality of that treatment. Um, and, uh, and you see, I think, throughout Scripture, this recognition that everyone is gifted with different talents. The, the, the New Testament talks about the body of Christ having more noble parts to it, more ennoble parts to it, parts that, that perform functions that are, that are, uh, you know, uh, you know, more, um, more interesting functions and parts that are, you know, people in the body who perform functions that no one really thinks about or talks about, but that are still very important. Um, but there's this, there's this broad array of, of, uh, of different talents within the body of Christ. Um, and there's never a sense in which, in which that's unfair there's never a sense in which the person who's at the head of that or who has a has an important job is somehow unjustly in that position and the person who has a kind of less important role to play is uh, is hard done by um the 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 injunctions are very much um around uh, around a sort of you are created uh how you are created and with what you've been given you know, lots of parables on this with what you've been given, you know, with that, you will be evaluated with that. You will be judged. If you've been given much, then much will be expected of you. Um, and if you've been given little uh, or few talents, uh, what's important is that you is that you use those talents to the best of your ability. That's a very, very inegalitarian, uh, I think, a kind of way of, of looking at the world and this idea of of kind of making people equal the bible is very clear on the distinctions between between men and women um and and how they and and who they are and how they how they've been created and the roles that they are to sort of fulfill and play in, in society um so so yeah i would i would broadly i would broadly agree with that um and someone just put up a comment on on forgiveness um and that that slots really nicely into this this uh, victimhood and and grievance uh, politics, because when you get into it, um, the essence of this kind of virtue culture that that's developed is um, it's 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 anti-forgiveness. It's an anti-forgiveness culture. You can never 
repent enough. You can never prostrate yourself enough in this in this kind of culture. Uh, whereas Christianity, the message of the gospel, the the work of Christ, and the message uh, of Christ is um, is that even the most wretched, even the most wretched among us, is uh, a child and a, and a and a creature and a creation of God, and can actually uh, find forgiveness and redemption. Um, when you look at when you look at the the, the this grievance politics. Um, it only wants to demoralize and demean, and uh, it, it, there's never there's no you, path to redemption. There's no path to redemption. There's no path to redemption. So, in you know, you can as you sort of juxtapose um, these these uh, these different ideologies against against biblical truth, you can start to see how radically some of them depart. From no, it, and, and be, uh, something that I've noticed uh, reading the Bible is all is this theme of uh, wretched humans uh, being uh, having this redemption arc, uh, starting off absolutely. as uh, committing absolutely horrific crimes or being a, a very sinful, absolutely sinful person, but then ending up with this ultimate uh, in this ultimate position of redemption. That seems to be a very popular theme throughout the book. Well, think think how think how contra to that cancel culture is. And um, I mean, cancel, well, cancel culture. Uh, can the word cancel has a certain uh, air of finality to it, doesn't it? Not. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's. Um, I mean, it's it's just unredemptive in the extreme, and and I mean, we we shouldn't neglect to hold to hold the 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 right of the political spectrum accountable to these standards as well. Um, you know, in in. In doing politics and in relating to to the left of the spectrum and even to the radical left, we've got to be careful. You know, we've got to check our hearts, and and uh, it's it's a it's a tough it's a it's a difficult bar. Um, it's a high bar, but um, to actually be able to offer forgiveness um, to others, to political opponents, even to the worst of our political opponents. Um, it doesn't mean appeasing. It doesn't mean appeasement. It doesn't mean uh, that we don't stand our ground um, and actually be very strong in the face of their kind of persecution. Um, but I think what it does mean in the final analysis is that no one is beyond redemption. No one is is to be written off. Um, once we get to the political psychology where your enemy, your political opponent, is to be written off. Then I think you've descended into, to sort of very very dark, deep and dark political places, and and you see that unfortunately happening, I would say mostly on the left of the of the political spectrum, the way they want to cancel their opponents, the way they regard their opponents as sort of beneath um, engagement, and uh, and and really, I mean, you're you've got bills now, you know, coming coming forth in the U.S. That are all about domestic terrorism, and you're going to start seeing a targeting of political opponents, and just a complete moral writing off of the other side of the spectrum. That is an incredibly dark place to go, um, and it's uh, it's completely counter to to um, to the biblical idea of of forgiveness and offering people your opponents paths to redemption, um, and uh, and considering them, you know, redeemable equals in, in the political discourse. I think the worst thing that the right wing could do is make the same mistake um, as, as the left are making. If, if the right wing goes down that same path, um, we're truly headed for, for, a, for a very, very dark place. And, uh, and I kind of hope that we don't go there. Right. Um, and yeah, that's been a theme on on my channel for a while now. This, uh, this I call it the 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 Mark principle of uh, Mark uh, uh, Mark eight, uh, eight verse uh, thirty six of what would it profit a man if he gains the entire world uh, but forfeits his soul? And I think that's the the principle when it comes to our values and our principles. I mean, what are you fighting for? You're fighting to preserve your values, your principles, and your culture. But if you're willing to give up those values and principles in order mm -hmm. to win. 
then uh, how much were they really worth in the end? I think that's the big question that people specifically on the right need to ask themselves. Um, and yeah, we had someone in the chat that was kind enough to give us the, the part of the Bible where your parable is from. It's the parable of the workers uh, from Matthew yes. 20, verse 1 to 16. So if anyone wants there to check themselves, there it is. Um, something that you brought up that I really want to, to get into before, uh, before the show is done is you were, talk, you, you were talking about revolution and about Antifa and civil disobedience. But from your reading of the Bible, what have you encountered uh, regarding civil disobedience and then taking it uh, to a farther extreme uh, revolution? You know, even? Yeah, look, I mean, I think this is, this is an incredibly good and difficult question, and I, I probably lack um to some degree the the sort of philosophical and theological depth to really do this this question justice what i would say is that the sort of standard kind of romans 13 response to this kind of stuff is really tired and really shallow and it's and it's not it's not a it's not a sufficient picture of the biblical narrative around around how we are to um to to be or to deal with our with our civil government um so people will cite romans 13 as as though is though the civil government is ordained by god and therefore you listen to everything they say and uh and and keep your head down and don't and don't rebel um, that's that's patently absurd for a number of reasons um I think the, probably the, the first reason is to say that that the scripture that talks about that in in Romans 13, the passage that talks about that, um, talks about the fact that government is instituted, civil government is instituted by God um, for the purpose of of achieving civil justice and 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 righteousness. <clears throat> um, and that it is subject to the laws of God and to and and to the um, the precepts of 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 the Lord. Um, so when governments um, disobey that, they are themselves um, moving into a place of of disharmony with that that Romans thirteen um, scripture. So I think that's an important thing to point out. And so now you're not dealing with a government that's that's um, that's instituted according to to biblical precepts and to uh, and, and and to the laws of God, but you're dealing with a kind of rogue civil government that is probably in the process of jumping the fence of its of its biblical authority, jumping into matters of morality and into church matters, jumping into matters of the family. You know, modern governments that 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 uh, have the right uh, or, or or create for themselves the right to take your children away if they think you're not doing a good job and and all this kind of nonsense. I mean, totally overstepping the sort of bounds of what a civil government is is supposed to do. And I think when you move into those into that territory, um, you start to see um, very many uh, biblical you know, a huge amount of biblical support for resisting and opposing such a government um, because such a government is not working towards um, the ends of of god and toward his moral purposes um, you have an incredible passage in in kings um where uh where i forget the exact scripture again i think it's i think it's uh one kings one sorry samuel in samuel so in one samuel uh, chapter eight, you have this this um, fascinating exchange between the Israelites and and Samuel. Israelites demand a king. That up until that point, they've had judges ruling over them. They've had this very decentralized governance system. You've got the twelve tribes of Israel. Um, each tribe uh, is subject to its its elders. Each tribe is subject to its kind of. Uh, uh, juristic uh, oversight and, and, and committees. They've all been given land around around Canaan. Um, and you've got this incredibly decentralized system and, and God puts in place judges who aren't kings. Um, they don't have the right of, of taxation, uh, it seems. 
but they act as a kind of wise elder um, and they probably would have been surrounded by a group of elders from the 12 tribes of Israel. And so you had this incredibly decentralized uh, governance system. And then what happens is as Israel starts facing opposition from other states, um, they start to demand a king. They start to demand a central authority, a central king. Um, and Samuel, uh, uh, in no uncertain terms, warns them about how bad an idea this is. In the first instance, he basically says that in demanding a king, a central king authority, they're actually sinning against God because they're, they lack faith in, um, in their true leader, which is the Lord. Um, secondly, he warns them about how uh, this, this king is going to tax uh, his people uh, uh, excessively, how he's going to draft their sons into the army and probably go off and fight you know, crazy uh, regime change wars and 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 all sorts of boondoggles like that so it's a really incredible scripture and then of course when you go into um the prophets uh isaiah jeremiah and various of the other prophets um their words towards their own governments are incredibly harsh um they bring words of judgment from the lord they have scathing criticisms for their governments for the way they're managing money for the way they are debasing the silver coinage, which is modern, the modern equivalent would be printing money and just devaluing the currency. Um, very, very serious admonitions um, towards them. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think I think if you if you consider the totality of this, and and you know, I'm not getting into it all in a very systematic way, and, and I probably lack some of the scriptural depth for this discussion. Um, but when you look at it in those terms, uh, it is not at all the case that that your civil government is this un, untouchable, uncriticizable um, entity. And ultimately, um, I think it's not even unremovable uh, by by certain means. I think what's really key is that um, in, 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 in the way that you oppose government, you don't tarnish the name of Christ. Um, you don't break the laws of God. Um, and so you maintain a kind of righteousness in the way that you oppose the state, in the way that you oppose an unrighteous government. That's, that's difficult. You know, that's, that's not easy. Um, to the extent that, that you take up arms against the government, um, I would say that it's, it, it should probably always be in a kind of defensive maneuver. Um, but we've, we know that governments have killed their people. Governments have attacked and killed their own populations. And I don't see any uh, biblical injunction that would prohibit um, a kind of just and, and righteous defense, physical defense of, of yourselves, your families and your communities against against a wicked government and um you know we have we have a lot of uh sort of injunction and admonition in in in, in the christian uh, church to pray for your leaders and to pray sort of positivity over their leadership and that's great but there are many many uh prayers in scripture where the where the prayer is praying for for god to break the teeth of the government to smash them um, and and to destroy them, and I think that there's there, there's a there's a space for a righteous prayer against a wicked government to 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 appeal to the Lord to destroy that government. Um, you you know you you saw it with with King David, uh, but you know the, the way he used to pray about destroying his enemies. Um, you could see you could see the way the prophets. Uh, would would uh, would bring very very harsh words of destruction against their own governments, against the governments of Judea and Samaria, um, and Israel. So, um, I think that getting the holistic context of this is, is is very very important. But I do think that that we all have to check ourselves, and we all have to be careful um, that that in opposing the state. And I mean, I've I've probably run afoul of this in my own life. 
um, but that in opposing the state we we maintain in our thought life and in our words a kind of a kind of righteousness um, and an obedience to God so that we don't become like them and we don't fall into the, the, those same traps of wickedness we've got to maintain our eyes on on the prize which is a society that's that's justly ordered and that's um, obedient fundamentally obedient to the words and the precepts um, of the Lord uh, and I think I think that balance is not easy um, but I don't see this kind of stuff being spoken about in the modern mainstream church. What I hear in the mainstream modern churches are just obey everything the government says, keep your head down, um, don't don't piss them off. Uh, they they are the ones in charge, and uh, you know just just pray for them, just pray for them, kind of thing. And um, yeah, maybe we should pray for them to be smashed. You know, maybe we should pray for, 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 for wicked rulers to, to meet the end that they deserve and that we can be blessed with, with righteous leaders. And then maybe we can defend ourselves against their predation um, and, if need be, take up arms. If they, if they want to attack their people, then their people should be willing to, to defend them. So, so there's, not, there, there's no biblical, um, as far as I can tell, there's no biblical... A license for wicked governments to just continue doing what they're doing but what I would say is that there's not it's not always um, the case that that it's appropriate to to overthrow the government even if they're wicked and um, that's that's kind of deeper wisdom that we maybe don't have time to get into but uh, but certainly opposing the state um, in in righteous ways I think is is very very important and I don't think that Christians are sufficiently alive to this in, in modern times and playing an appropriate role in, uh, in calling out what I think are tremendous injustices. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's some really smart uh, Christian leaders right now that, that believe uh, many countries like America, probably like South Africa too, are in many ways going through a period of judgment um with unwise leaders um who are you know and, and unrighteousness in the people it's not just the governments that are the problem you know the, the, there's 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 widespread unrighteousness in the people and uh what you what you sow you shall reap even as a nation and so you know i think that there's many political systems that are kind of crumbling under the weight of this truth um and i think it's the job of christians to be ready to be able to defend themselves against predation, to be ready with with wisdom, and to be ready with insight into how to rebuild a uh, a righteous and and successful political system uh, after this. Um, and uh, so that's kind of sorry. I know I'm going on hell of a long, but but these are some of my thoughts. No, it's all good. It's all very good. Because, uh, yeah, and I guess it's worth it's worth taking a bit of time on this because there's. There's such a lot of shallowness on this, and I know I need to get a lot deeper on 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 on, on the thinking on this stuff. But um, as I say, I think I think the the scriptures are full of um, of how to to oppose wicked governments, and and there's many different ways and means of doing that, and there's different times for different seasons. It's not always wise just to go like a bull in a china shop against a, an, an evil state or an evil government because you can end up you can end up uh you know doing doing more harm to your cause than than good there's times for that kind of boldness and that kind of bravery and there's times for more cunning and more craftiness and cleverness and the bible even talks about that about about how we need to be very wise in, in how we take these decisions to oppose wicked governments uh, yeah, something I've just found absolutely striking is uh, how fast things have fallen apart as uh, as societies moved away from from Christianity and the fundamental principles of it. I mean, it's not just something you can speculate about. You can just use your eyes and see what's going on. There seems yeah. to be a direct correlation between uh, the secularization of society and just 
absolute depravity and de uh, degeneration you see all around you. Uh, but also something that's increased is the, the view of or the pursuit of utopias. It seems like people have uh, replaced religion with just the pursuit of utopia. But uh, as you read in the Bible, uh, the pa paradise is guarded by an angel with a flaming sword. So I think uh, that's, uh, that should tell you all you need to know about the, the pursuit of uh, utopia as a ball, trying to build your own heaven on earth. Um, but on that note, Russell, uh, we've had an excellent discussion. I just have and uh, on that note of uh, what we're seeing around us, there's one more thing I want you to end off on, and that is the, the question of people looking at the world around them, seeing things falling apart, feeling hopeless, not knowing where their courage will come from. What would you say is the an antidote to this? Where can people find the courage that they need and the almost the, the antidote or the, the vaccine for the nihilism the, that's creeping up on them? maybe as a final thought to, to close things off. <clears throat> Look, the starting point is the gospel. The starting point is the person of Christ himself. Um, there, is, there is no more important person in, the, in our faith, and there is no more, more important person um, in the Bible. Uh, and and I think uh, I think starting with a proper picture of Christ is is hugely important for people. And the way you do that is you go and read the Gospels. You go and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then you go and read about Christ um, in in the the writings of Paul, in the Book of Acts, in in, in you know the various uh, sort of epistles. Um, and you can also read about Christ in in the in the prophets. You can read about Christ's the prophetic uh, in, in the Old Testament, that the entire Bible points towards Jesus Christ. Um, and, I, and he is an immense source of hope. And, and you know, it's time for Christians. If for, you know, I speak mainly to the Christians who are watching this, this broadcast. You've got to take Jesus Christ seriously and you've got to take the Bible seriously. It's time to take the scriptures seriously and to meditate on them. Um, and I need to do it more. We all need to do it more. I don't read enough of my Bible, and neither do you. And uh, we can all we can all do better on that front. Um, once you get into the Word of God, an amazing thing starts to happen. And it's not it's not any kind of fairy magic. It's just the it's just the power of the truths that you're reading. And as you start meditating on those things, those ancient truths, all the noise and all the stresses and all the kind of irrelevancies of the present day really do and can start to kind of fade away. And you put, you put biblical truth and you put God once again at the center of your, your life's orbit, um, it starts to really reorder things. And the chaos that that I feel quite often on a day-to-day -day basis because you're busy and you've got various problems and challenges and you made mistakes and you, you offended someone and you did something wrong and you're in trouble for this or that, um, or you've just got stresses and strains. Um, these things really can start to be properly ordered when you put God and, and, and his truths at the center of your life. So engaging in, in these scriptures is an incredibly peaceful um, and, and sort of calming and, order, and ordered way to start making sense of the world that you're living in. And, and, and all I would say to end off is that anyone who thinks that, that the Bible is irrelevant for the modern time is just completely naive to what to what it contains um, and has not grasped um, the truths contained therein and what it's saying about about any era that you read it in because as you said earlier Alan, you know humans don't change and 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 the core reality of who we are and how we got here hasn't changed so i think that this is that the Bible is a, a, a message for all times, for virtually all uh, circumstances or all circumstances and for all contexts. doesn't mean you're going to open the book and find what you need straight away. You've got to dig. 
And it's that digging process that is actually the whole point. Um, you're not just going to open the Bible and voila. You've got to spend the time. You've got to invest into understanding the narrative, understanding the context, understanding the wisdom. And, and once you put that investment in, you start to reap over time. You reap an incredible harvest of, of truth and wisdom. There's some, there's some mysteries in the Bible. Um, and rather than sort of criticize them, sometimes it's worth being humble and just reflecting on them, reflecting on the things you don't understand and holding that mystery in a kind of tension um, until, until you are able to see it um, through time. So I would, get, I would say to people, take Jesus Christ seriously. Um, take the Bible seriously. Take the wisdom contained therein seriously. And uh, once you engage with that in a very chaotic world, I, I think you will find a tremendous flood of, of peace and insight that enters your life um, that I don't think you can get anywhere else. Uh, those are very wise words, Russell. A lot of people always ask me, uh, what's the most based book you can recommend? And I would always recommend the Bible if they want to uh, go get some knowledge there. It's also a big white book. A big, uh, probably, the most, probably the most based book in the Bible is, uh, is the book of Job. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, just one last thing from the chat. Uh, Sideliner Opinion says, Russell is bubbling over what he strongly believes in but almost never gets a chance to talk about. Wonderful conversation. Time just flew by. I think he was referencing when you said uh, you uh, you said you were rambling or talking too long or implying that you were talking too long. Um, yeah, and I think uh, that is a problem for a lot of people is that we they don't get to they don't get into context where they can talk about these things and i think that's something that's very abnormal if you look at the history of humanity these are things that were always discussed in social contexts um, and in public contexts and it seems to have faded out uh, to a large degree and i think that's something very uh, very concerning i think something we need to do something about but uh, russell and that's what we're doing with this type of stream well last last quick comment and i know you want to close this off but one minute. I, I think you're absolutely right, and I think we must we must push back against this. Um, what the world out there wants to tell you is that the Bible is an absolutely ridiculous book, that adhering to anything in it is irrational, um, that believing in in a divine Christ is a completely ridiculous idea, and that believing that we are created by a transcendent, supernatural uh, omnipotent God is a fanciful and silly idea. Um, and I, you know, none of this is true. Uh, these are, these are absolutely valid, rational beliefs. It is rational to believe that we are created. Um, if you believe we're created and you believe there's a supernatural God, um, then believing in a supernatural Christ is, is not a, is not a big jump at all. Um, and believing in the power of the of of the word, and the power of the ancient scriptures, and the wisdom contained therein, these are these are principles that have guided our very civilization for thousands of years. To reject them is absolute folly. And so we must have these conversations. Uh, we must be bold, and uh, we mustn't be ashamed of of these kinds of conversations and and the kinds of things we believe in. Um, and I think pushing back boldly against this this kind of secular atheistic narrative is quite fun and certainly something I intend to do and uh, I think we mustn't be ashamed of it at all I think we must keep having these conversations and very importantly and we didn't even really get into economics much today so we can do that another time yeah. but there is so much applied wisdom for economics for relationships for marriage for politics uh, you know you name it there's there's very many areas that this touches on uh you know psychology depression um you know all these kinds of things the bible speaks very much into uh, into all these areas and we must be bold i think in having these conversations more and more hmm. Uh, yeah, Russell, thank you very much for your time. Uh, you've been very generous tonight. And also, thank you very much uh, for uh, sharing all your thoughts. Uh, I found it very interesting. As a lot of people in the chat said, uh, time flew by. They seem to have enjoyed it quite a bit. 
Um, and I'm going to have to have you on again in the future, seeing as we've only covered about 10% of what I wanted to talk about. I know. Let's do it. We'll we'll do a, we'll do a proper economics, uh, biblical economics session. And I know some friends watching want us to talk about usury, so we can get into usury and 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 uh, debasing money and uh, lending and borrowing and all these kind of good things. Mm. And the jubilee system and 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 property rights in the Bible. There's some there's some great stuff we can get into. So we'll we'll hold that over for next time. Oh, definitely. And then uh, also thank you very much for everyone that tuned in. If uh, you are interested in following Russell, there's a link to his Twitter in the description, also a link to his website. Um, and then uh, keep an eye on this channel as well. If you're new here, if you're not a subscriber, uh, subscribe for these types of conversations if you enjoy them. Also leave a like, uh, that helps out the show. And then I'll also see you again on the next episode uh, when we will be talking to another interesting guest. So thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, good night, everyone. God bless. Yes, and nice. uh, remember, uh, stay uh, on that, that mark principle of uh, not giving up your principles in order to gain the world. Rather, uh, retain your soul. It's worth it.